All right, well, good morning. Um, we are going to be talking, we're transitioning in our series. Have you guys enjoyed this relationship series? I hope this has been helpful. You know, just wading into how do we do relationships for real? Like, what is really a kingdom way to do it that's not, I don't know about you, but I've, you know, been in church a long time. I've heard a lot of sermons. Oftentimes, I feel like things get reduced into these really annoying little religious packages that just don't work. Anybody? No? I'm the only one. Um, and it's like, how do you take the kingdom principle in God's heart and actually walk that out in a way that is applicable and real and loving and balanced and healthy and all those things? And so we're just really grateful that you guys are down for the journey. And uh, so we, we talked about dating for a couple weeks. We talked about marriage for a couple weeks. We're transitioning into parenting today. If you're like, dang it, I got up and got to church. I got zero kids. Why am I at church? Listen, if you hope to one day have children, if you have children, if you are a friend of somebody who is trying to figure out how to raise them kids, okay, if you have any, you know, if you are an aunt, an uncle, you know, a, a godparent, we need a better understanding about how to truly love and lead our kids because we have seen the fruit. We are, many of us are the result of the fruit of some really messed up parenting, of just some deficiencies. And my heart and prayer is that we would be on a journey together and get inspired together, that there is a better way, that there's a better way. And of course, we're not going to just answer every question and you know, give you the 37 point how to perfectly raise your children. Like that's not happening if you're hoping for that in today's sermon. Sorry, you're not getting it. Um, but there is a better way. And my heart and hope this morning is that we could get just infused with some courage that God has strategy for us to really love and love our kids well and raise our kids well. And so um, we're going to jump into that today. So, um, you know, I remember, you know, for us, those of you who have kids, maybe you had a similar experience, unless you were far more ready for children than we were. I, we thought we were ready, you know, we, I babysat, my siblings had kids, like all my friends had kids. Um, some of you guys know this, we joke, I mean, it's not, it's not funny, but it is what it is. I grew up in the teen pregnancy capital of the world, like of the United States, not the world, of the United States, like the county I'm from, so... By like at the time I was graduating middle school, several of my friends already had kids. By the time I graduated high school, they had multiple children. Like, children were a part of my life, you know. Um, but even in that, I'll never remember, ever, ever, ever forget. Sorry, the the moment that after having our first baby, um, it was like I, I was in absolute shock that they were like, okay you can leave now. And we were like, no, 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 no. We're not ready. We're not ready. We're not ready. Like, I, you know, I, there's, we're not ready. Like, is there a nurse that can come with us? Like, cause you're, this child is entirely dependent. Like literally, if you don't do something right, they die. Like if you don't lay them right, they could die. If you know, like all the things. And we were so like, oh my God, we don't know what we're doing. And we we're so traumatized by this moment of how can they possibly just send us home with this tiny little cre creature, you know, like this tiny little person. How can they, we be responsible? And I remember that, that just absolute um, terror in that moment. And then, you know, getting home and, and those first, I don't know, probably in that first day or so, um, you know, realizing how much you don't know. You can read all the books and you can do all the things, but you just really don't know. And um, I remember we're home, we're like, you know, she, she needs a bath. Oh my gosh. How do you bathe this little thing, you know, like without breaking it? And, you know, Hona, this is also a very true dynamic of our relationship. Hona is, is always very confident that he knows how to do things he doesn't really know how to do. But um, he insists, he picks her up and he's like, I got this. I'm going to give her a bath. And I'm like, Pfft. Please, sir, you're not doing that without me, number one. Like, calm down. He's like, I got this. And I'm like, what makes you think you are so qualified to give this, you know, newborn baby a bath? And he's like, I used to bathe my ferret. <laughs> Literally what he said to me. 
that he had a pet ferret and he bathed it. And so that qualified him to bathe our newborn baby because they're slippery and all over the place and he, got, he has it. So, uh, <laughs> all that to say, you know, just because you have a parent doesn't mean you actually know how to be one. And just because you were a child doesn't mean you actually know how to raise one or you had a, a ferret in your past. Doesn't necessarily mean you know how to bathe one, right? So there's a lot of learning. Um, there's a lot of learning in the process and we're very much still in that process. Um, you know, now that tiny little newborn that we were handed um, is 18 and then came a, you know, now we have a 15 year old and a, you saw the 13 year old. Um, we've had a lot of learning in this process and you know, I wish I could tell you it gets easier. It doesn't. You never stop learning because your children never stop changing and growing and morphing and new seasons. And as soon as you master one, enjoy it for 30 seconds because there's a whole other season that you now have to become, start at you know, zero level learning how to love and nurture your, your child in that season. And so it's a, it's a lifelong journey of learning. And, you know, each child, parents, you know, this is so completely different, completely different. Um, and what works for one doesn't work for the other. You know, how you encourage one doesn't encourage the other. How you discipline one doesn't work on the other. And so there's a lot of just constant growing and learning in this parenting journey. And the reality is, parents, you know, this parenting never ends. Even at nine o'clock at night, you know, when you're tired, I'll, I'll give you an example. You know, we work on Sundays. Shocker. But now we have three teenagers that are like, sorry, Saturday nights, it's homecoming and it's a this and it's a, and so all night long, you know, we're still parenting at three in the morning. We're like, are you here? You know, what's happening? It's just part of it. It's part of it. You, parenting never stops, right? It doesn't stop on the weekends. It doesn't stop when you're tired. You know, it doesn't even stop when they're grown, grown. Those of you with grown kids, you understand, like, it doesn't stop. You're still nurturing and loving and championing and caring for and, and praying for your kids, you know? And so it's this beautiful, lifelong journey of um, loving and caring for that tiny little baby that gets handed you in the hospital or whenever they, that kid comes into your life, all right? So, you know, when I think about the invitation of parenting, this is what I think. Parenting provides an opportunity for you to reflect, model, and demonstrate who God is as a good and loving father to your child. Parenting is this giant, you get a trillion chances at it, opportunity to reflect to your kid who God is as a good father, who God is as a good parent. Parenting is meant to put flesh and bones and words and experiences and hugs um, and actions and a visual demonstration to how God loves and cares for us. I think parenting is arguably, you know, the strongest tool for evangelism that exists on the planet. Parents have the opportunity to demonstrate what unconditional love looks like, what mercy looks like, what care and healthy discipline look like, what not giving up on somebody looks like. And as you do that, you give your child a glimpse of what God looks like. Truly. And we also know the opposite is true, right? Oftentimes when people have had really painful or dysfunctional parental relationships, they struggle to see God as good. You know, they, they carry a lot of that. Like if, if their home environment growing up was you know, you're always in trouble, many times people translate that to their relationship with God. They feel like they're always in trouble. Or if it feels insecure, you feel insecure in your relationship with God. We, we know that parents have the ability to bring the greatest impact for how people see God. That's a big deal. And I remember a woman once in our church who was raised in a completely godless home. And... Um, Yet when she, she had an encounter, you know, later where God showed her how he'd always, when this woman came to know Christ, and she saw how God had 
her whole life been present. She was like, how? I grew up in a completely godless home. And he began to show her she had good, loving parents. And every time her parents loved her, cared for her, were gracious to her, it was God, how God loved her. And it, it, that's what brought this woman to the Lord. It's pretty powerful. So we have this big invitation, this big opportunity to model how God loves us and treats us with our kids. And you know, when you think about it, your parents' behavior, how they treated you, is the primary factor, not how, you know, great were their parenting skills or how much they gave you. It's how they behaved around you is the primary factor on whether or not you actually respect your parents to this day or how much you want to be around your parents or how much time you want to spend around your parents. It's based off of how your parents behaved with you, right? It's not just, you know, you wanting to be like your parents or you wanting to be around your parents or have your parents in your life to this day is based off of primarily how your parents behaved with you. So often, I don't think we realize the power of how we are behaving as parents is the primary factor in how our relationship with our children will go. In fact, our behavior is the greatest predictor of respect and influence that we're going to have in our kids' lives. So all of parenting is just like trillion opportunities to model to your kid who God is, right? How you handle their weakness, their insecurity, their sin, their strength, their dreams, their wrestles, their confusion, how you handle that is literally modeling to them who God is. And so today, you know, I want to talk about spirit-led parenting. What does it mean to really be, to parent in a different way? To parent being led by the spirit, to parent in a godly way. I, I truly believe the greatest challenge in parenting is not how to successfully, hear me, not how to successfully shape, fix, control, or manage your child. And that's hard. The greatest challenge in parenting is rather how to shape, fix, control, and manage yourself in the presence of your child. Hands down. How we manage ourselves when our kids are acting crazy. How we control ourselves, right? Now, I know this might be a a little bit of an uncommon, possibly an unpopular opinion, (laughs) Um, but I'd like to address something that I think is a fallacy. I think it's a myth, and it's this idea that you can judge someone's parenting by how their kids turned out. Wait, what? Why is that not true? You know, I wouldn't necessarily agree with that statement. Now, of course, there's some truth, sure, you could pull from that. But it's the same thing as saying a child's behavior is a direct reflection of their parents. And I think that's a dangerous statement. Now, yeah, there might be some truth in that, but can I be honest with you? You know, this is... I feel like I confess, like, things I shouldn't confess up here. Um, Too often, too often... My sister and I, she's probably watching, like, oh my God, stop saying that. My sister and I have found ourselves many times being like, dude, like, this makes no sense. Like, how is it that some of the most dysfunctional people we know, we know, because they're our friends, they are like, they, they be messy, like, messy people, like, messy people, right? Dysfunctional people have some of the most compliant, sweet natured, well behaved children. We are always like, they do not deserve those kids. They do not deserve those kids. I mean, how in the world did they get those kids, you know? And then you see other people who are such good parents, godly. They are invested. They were, I mean, nobody's perfect, but they are. I mean, man, they are doing it well. They are loving their kids well. They're reading all the books. They're doing all the things. They are so extravagant with their kids. And they, they, you know, almost inevitably, one of them, you know, there's one kid in the pack that's just blowing up their life right? Or maybe, you know, you've experienced, um, you know, where it's like, maybe your kids are doing great in one season, and then you have the exact same parenting, and in another season, they're not doing great, right? 
and the reality is, you know, seasons come and go, but the, the truth is your child's choices and behaviors are not a reflection of you. And I think we have to dismantle that if we're going to parent well. And it's going to be really, really hard to get over, but you're going to have to. Your choices and your behavior, how you are responding to your child, are a reflection of you. Now, the same as, you know, your child acting out is not a reflection of you. Your child's accomplishments, you cannot internalize that as a reflection of you either. Their accomplishments or their failures, they are not a direct reflection of you. Because, if, listen, if you believe that they are, you will find yourself inevitably driving your child. You will find yourself trying to manipulate or control your child to act a certain way. If it's a reflection of you. You will find yourself raging when they are not protecting your ego and reputation. I speak of no, I, I don't, I've heard. I've heard from other parents. I, I don't really know this personally. Um, if your value and your success and your security is tied to how well or, you know, your child is doing, you will begin to put unrealistic expectations on them. You will begin to pressure them. You will begin to, to manipulate them, not intending to. It will just naturally happen. Because what happens is, you know, you'll begin to vicariously live through your child. You'll parent from insecurity and, and fear. Ego will get in the way. You begin to compare them to somebody else's kid. And it becomes very hard to make a decision with the Holy Spirit as to what's actually best for your child because so much of your own fear and insecurity and ego are in the way. You know, Bill Johnson said something that I think many have said a, a version of this, but it's, if you don't live by the praises of men, you won't die by their criticism. Many of you know what I'm talking about. You know, when you have that first, some of you, maybe this is your example, your, your experience, you have that first baby, just an angel baby. They are just so sweet and perfect and compliant. And you are, you're like, I, I mean, I've like really mastered like gentle parenting. And you just, you're like, we're really good at structure. We prayed a lot for our, you know, kids and really invite the Holy Spirit in our home and... You know, I mean, so we have this, like, sweet little angel baby. And you do all those things, second time around, and the child's feral. <laughs> right? It's just true. Or it's the opposite. You know, like, so often, so often, we, we fall into this trap of um, getting ourselves in the way of how to really love and serve our kids. I want you to think about this. If the, the parent-child relationship is meant to demonstrate how God treats us, right? Is my behavior a reflection of God? When I'm acting a fool, is God like, oh my God, I'm the worst Lord. I'm such a bad Lord. <laughs> Doubt it. He's like, girl, get your life together. Right? It, me acting crazy is not a direct result of something God has done. Now, I'm not sitting here saying because there are things, you know, also you need to take accountability for. Accountability for. You know, your kids acting out in insecurity, it could very well be a result because you keep, you know, tearing down their confidence or whatever. But you get what I'm saying in general. Like, if we're going to really parent well, we have, to, we have to remove our ego from the equation. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. And this is really helpful when thinking about parent, parenting. We don't parent from fear. And it's so easy to, you know, every second of every day, parent from fear. We don't parent from fear, but we have power means we can be powerful, we, we have love, and we have self-control from the Holy Spirit to, to lead and to love in a different way. 
Notice, self-control is a fruit of the Spirit, not other control. Self-control is a fruit of the Spirit, not kid control. Not spouse control, but that was last week, okay? Self-control. You are empowered by God to control yourself, not try to manipulate and control your friends, your work environment, the people around you. What does this look like? Right, when your kid is angry and, and maybe becoming disrespectful, you're able, through the Holy Spirit, to stay calm and respectful. Or when your kid's freaking out and spiraling in fear, you're able to stay in a place of peace. This is available. You don't have to just reflect and match your kid's energy all the time. When your kid is not making the choices you want them to make, you're able to lean into relationship and connection and not move into manipulation and control. If we're going to reflect God well to our kids, we have to learn to be okay outside of them. We have to learn to model a healthier way to manage our own big feelings, our own experiences. Right? The goal is to raise kids who know that God helps free them from their fear and helps them be powerful and loving and have their own self-control. But sitting and telling a kid to control themselves is never going to be as powerful as you modeling what being a powerful person looks like, you modeling what love looks like, you modeling what self-control looks like. When we model it, it's far more powerful. But man, let me tell you what. Parents, we be tired. So it's easier to be like, act right or I'm going to kill you. You know, like, it's easier to try to just, ah, like, externally control them versus control myself. So much harder. It's so much harder for me to be like, you know, get control of yourself. Yet I am not even modeling how to have control of my own self. Whew. The work, the invitation to follow Jesus, it is, it is not for the faint of heart, y'all. It is not like, it's not. Because listen, if you signed up for easy, just get a bigger belt. I mean, you know, like get a bigger rod, get a bigger belt, get a, you could do that. If, if you want just easy, now it's not going to work out great for you in the end because you're not going to end up with a relationship with that kid. But if you want to somehow just survive, you could just externally beat it out of them. You could just externally force them to obey you. But that is not at all the invitation of the cross. The invitation of the gospel. To learn to live a better way. To learn to love. To make it about relationship. You know, which brings me to just, I think, the, the key in godly parenting really is to make relationship and connection your primary goal. Relationship and connection with your kid. Because if the parent-child relationship, right, is supposed to look like us and God, what is God's primary focus with you? I, I have walked with God and loved God since I was two years old. Never in my 25 years Never has God made my behavior his primary focus. My behavior is important, but it's not ever been his primary focus in my life. My whole life, his primary focus has been my heart, my connection, our relationship. He pursues my heart. He pursues connection with me. From there, when there's relationship, then he can influence my behavior, my beliefs, whatever. But it's he has influence because he has my heart. Are you with me? His focus is not just your behavior. His primary focus is always your heart. It's always connection with you, relationship with you. And this has to be our primary focus with our kids. Our primary focus is connection to their heart. It's relationship with them even when they're acting crazy or whatever. It's, it's connection. And from that place, when we have real connection with our kids, we have the ability to influence, and parents understand how important influence is. That we, begin to, we can motivate them from the inside out, not just the outside in, because there's real connection and relationship.
Connection-driven parenting always pursues relationship, relationship first. And it understands that we motivate our kids from the inside out. And you know, it can be a little scary when your kid starts to act out and your impulse is to like control, control the situation. Um, and, and often it's our fear response. And I'm not saying that there's not moments where you need to be like, you know, con immediately control the situations. You absolutely have to do that sometimes for their safety or whatever. That's not what I'm talking about. But I'm talking about if that's your habit and your pattern is just always control versus connection, that is not going to work. That might work out for you when they're five. But as somebody standing here with a 13, 15, and 18-year-old, you know, three very strong-willed children, bless the Lord, I don't know where they get it. it must be their dad. <laughs> um, I can tell you that it's not going to work for you, my friend. It's going to be heart connection so that you can have real influence in their life. So connection-driven parenting always pursues relationship first. And we understand, right, that that motivation is from the inside. So it seeks the heart. It seeks the you know, the, the relationship. And what does that look like? You know, that might look like becoming really good at listening to your kids. Instead of just assuming. You get that letter or that, you know, that email from the school. Instead of just, I already know what you did, you know, and like leaning in. Hey, talk to me. What happened today? I'd love to hear your perspective. Versus showing up like, you know, guns loaded, blazing, ready for that kid to walk through the door. Lean into relationship first, right? Help me understand where you're coming from. Help me understand your perspective. It's, it's giving them the benefit of the doubt, leaning in. It's validating their feelings. You know, I don't, I don't know the kind of culture you grew up in, but a lot of cultures, like, children's feelings aren't validated, God always validates our feelings, even if we're feeling stupid stuff. Even if we're feeling what we're feeling because our own stupid choices. He's still valid. He doesn't shame us for feeling what we're feeling. He sits with us in it. He, okay. Yeah. Like, he's, he doesn't shame us. He, he validates what we're feeling. Pursuing our kids relationally. That doesn't mean you're like your kid's best friend. That's a whole other problem. Your kids need a parent more than they need a best friend. There's a lot of people who can be best friends for them. There's only, you know, one mom and one dad unless you get like a bonus one somewhere along the way or, you know, they need a parent. You know, they need somebody to parent them. Um, but pursue, pursue them relation, relationally. You know, invest in what they're interested in. Be a safe place to talk about hard things. Ooh, parents. <laughs> We know that can be hard because the temptation is like so often, you know, especially like parenting teenagers, so often you just like keep your face in control, like whoo, and they telling you something they did or something their friend did and you want to be like, heck? you know, like you want to lose your mind and you just got to be like, be a safe place because I want them to keep telling me <laughs> the stupidity that they are doing, you know, like I, be in a safe place where you can like, not, once again, not shame them not humiliate them, but also not be like, fist bump, great, keep going. No, like a safe place where you can process, you can challenge them, you can encourage them, you, you know. Um, but being a safe place, that's part of having relationship first, heart connection first, right? Um, as parents, adjusting to their needs and feelings. A lot of us grew up or come from a generation of parents that never had that. You made zero adjustments for children, you're lucky you're alive. You know, a lot of our parents were raised in that kind of a way. Like, you're lucky somebody fed you today. We don't make adjustments for children. But I think about all the time, and this is not, you know, putting your kid in the center of your family and your world. No, they're a part of a family. The kid doesn't need to be the center of your universe. That's also dysfunctional. But as parents, we should, if relationship is, is primary, Anybody that I have a relationship with, I'm happy to make some adjustments, some accommodations, some, right, like compromises for them because I love them. And that's one of the ways that we're modeling that to our kids. 
Another way of you know, keeping connection primary is never prioritizing rules over relationship. Never shaming, humiliating, or dishonoring our kids. Being more interested in the why that they're acting the way they are versus just the actions. You know, your relational connection will always take you a lot further than your rules will. And that is the truth. But, you know, so relationship is our primary goal. It's the the primary thing we're going after is heart connect. That doesn't mean we don't discipline. Discipline's necessary. Ephesians 6, 4 says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. Do not exasperate them to the point of resentment with demands that are trivial or unreasonable or humiliating or abusive, nor by showing favoritism or indifference to any of them, but bring them up tenderly with loving kindness in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. All right, so, you know, once again, if how we parent is meant to reflect how God treats us, how do we discipline? How do we figure this out? I know a lot of parents um, today are trying to figure this out. How do, we, how do we discipline in a way that's a kingdom way to do this? Because maybe having seen past generations done this in a way just that they knew how to do it, that culturally they did it, but what is, is there a better way? And um, I think it's first important to understand the difference between discipline and punishment. Okay, so discipline means to train, empower, develop, teach, correct, strengthen, to make better. Punishment is a form of payback to inflict pain and suffering for a wrongdoing, to hurt. Punishment doesn't usually have any vision or creativity, and most of the time it doesn't actually heal the offense or make anybody better for it. But you made them pay for it. Discipline and punishment are different. How does God handle our sin? You know, at the heart of every sin, of every transgression, is a damaged relationship. Right? So we've all sinned, and we've broken our relationship with God. And what did God do as a result of our sin? Did he punish us? No. He restores us in relationship. How does God handle our sin? He helps to restore us in relationship. If not, right, if, if the goal of, of discipline is, is, well, let me say this, the goal of discipline should be to restore relationship. Discipline needs a goal. If not, we out here just, you know, taking all kinds of stuff away. We don't even know what we're doing half the time. I, I, parents, I'm sure you've done this too. We were like, we just gave this discipline and, or whatever, you know, consequence, call it whatever you want. We're like, yeah, that was crap. That did not work. Did not work. I remember one time when Malika was little, and that child, you know, she's our free spirited artist, all things creative. And then there's Josiah with like everything organized in his room and completely different children. But her room was a disaster and toys everywhere and art supplies everywhere and dress up stuff everywhere. And I was so done. We kept trying to, you know, teach her to keep her room clean and she couldn't. And so I was like, you know what? I found it. I'm gonna get her, right? So I'm like, you know what, if your room isn't kept clean, um, you know, we're going to have to unfortunately just give your stuff away because you can't manage it. You can't manage it. And I'm tired of yelling you about it. Like, so we're going to give all your toys away to kids who don't have toys. <laughs> Threw it in there, you know. And you, <laughs> she looks at me and she's like, our, I mean, this child just bleeds justice, you know. She looks at me and she was like, what a great idea. <laughs> Mommy, what a great idea. I know so, there's so many. Can we, at that time, Cassandra, who's one of our justice partners, was working in Somalia, and she was like, could we send it with Cassandra to Somalia to give to the kids? She was thought it was the best idea ever and that she wouldn't have to keep it clean and that we could, you know. And I was like, yeah, that didn't work, you know. Um, <laughs> but I could tell you a thousand things like that that I've tried that were like, that was, I should have really listened to the Holy Spirit for a better idea. Um, <laughs> You know, but when you think about the goal of discipline is about helping restore the relationship. 
if we try to keep that our goal, now that doesn't work in every little situation, but for the most part, if that can be our goal, my goal in discipline is about helping to heal broken relationship. So I'm going to give you a couple examples. Rather than just being like, time out, or you know, whatever, trying to bring, help the kids see over and over and over, you have damaged a relationship here, and you have to fix it. You need to clean it up, right? So, hey, you're hurting your brother and making him sad with how you're hitting him with that toy. I'm going to take the toy away until you can go and make it right with your brother, and you can make me feel safe and trust that you're going to be kind and loving to your brother again. Back to relationship versus just, give me that toy, you know? Helping them understand, even from a toddler, understand that there's relationship you're hurting when you're making those choices, right? Or things like, um, I'm going to need you to write an apology letter to your teacher and clean the mess you made before we can move on. Relationship, not just 20 lashes because you were stupid with your teacher. Like, go fix the relationship you just messed, messed up, right? Um, you really dishonored your sister by that choice. So I need you now to go back to your sister and find out what you need to do to make it right. Oh, I don't want to do that. Well, you messed up a relationship here. You're going to have to go fix that, right? Um... The way you're using your phone has broken trust with us. So I'm going to take your phone until you're willing to rebuild that trust in our relationship because I want to be able to trust you. Trust is so vital for us in this relationship. Examples, right? So kind of just things to think about with it. But the thing with handling messes um, is God somehow in his wisdom has given us free will. And he is not afraid of our messes. But boy, are we afraid of our kids' messes. We sure are. I mean, it's just, it's just like, it's like innate in us. But if we're really going to try to do this how God does it, we have to, which is why you got to get your ego out of it, right? We can't be afraid of our kids making messes. Now, this isn't like, go do whatever, Go play with knives. Like, live your life. I'm not talking about, like, not putting healthy boundaries and things, age-appropriate things around your kids. But what I am saying is the, the drive in parents to fix everything, you know, bubble wrap their entire lives so they never get hurt, they never make a mess. Oh, my gosh, you know, I'll fix it for you. I mean, the amount of times my kids have asked me to tell, lie, lie to their teacher about something, I'm like, I am not going to do that. Can you just tell them that I, like, have a doctor's appointment? Like, that's a lie. Like, sit in your own consequence, my friend. You did not do your paper. Like, there's something actually powerful about letting your child experience, like, trusting them enough to experience the consequences of their own choices versus always rescuing, always helicoptering, always trying to, uh, you know, avoid them from being in pain, of course, it is natural to want to let your, you know, help your kid avoid pain. I mean, that's a, that's a good part of parenting, too, is to be like, hey, my recommendation is you do not do that right now. That is a bad choice. But when they do it, right, what, what, how does God respond to our own weakness? He is loving. He lends his strength. He is with us. He doesn't shun us or put, push us out, but he also gives us the space to clean our mess. Have you noticed? God doesn't just miraculously take away the conse natural consequences in life when you do something dumb. Like you speed and you get a speeding ticket and you don't get this miraculous like Holy Spirit removed my ticket. I don't have to deal with it. No, you have to deal with the natural consequences. Like God allows us to deal with that. Because he's a good God who, who is trying to discipline us, train us, strengthen us, help us learn to grow and become better. And so the reality is we get to learn as parents to be a safe place for our kids when they do make mistakes, right? We're not shaming them or holding it over them. Because if we do that, they're not going to come to us when they're in trouble, so many of us have had to unlearn dysfunctional things in our relationship with God. When you're in sin and you're making mistakes, maybe you run from God. 
rather than just coming right to God. Like when we mess up, we should be able to run right to God. He is a safe place. He's a safe place to help us deal with the mess we've made. We don't have to pretend like we're not doing this dumb thing that he already knows we're doing. We don't have to first, you know, fix ourselves up and get it all together and then come to him. No, God is always ready to sit with us in the mess to help us, to encourage us, to strengthen us. And we get to be that for our kids. It's relationship-centric. Discipline helps us grow in our relationship, and the driving force of godly parenting is love. Most of us have probably heard, if you've been to a wedding at all in your life, probably heard 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. I'm going to put it, we'll put it up here on the screen. 1 Corinthians 4 through 7. And um, this is the Passion Translation, but I want us to change out the word love for godly parenting for a moment and read this together. Godly parenting is large and incredibly patient. Godly parenting is gentle and consistently kind to all. Godly parenting refuses to be jealous when blessings come to someone else and they have this perfectly well-behaved child. (laughs) Godly parenting does not brag about one's achievements nor inflate its own importance. It means ego and pride are not in the middle of it. Godly parenting does not traffic in shame and disrespect, nor selfishly seek its own honor. Godly parenting is not easily irritated, Jesus help us, or quick to take offense. Godly parenting joyfully celebrates honesty and finds no delight in what is wrong. You know, honesty, that's not just like not telling a lie. That's letting your kids be authentic and show up as who they are. Being honest about what's really going on in them. Right? Um, Godly parenting is a safe place of shelter. It never stops the believing the best in your kids. Godly parenting never takes failure as defeat. Because you're going to have a lot of failure. But it's not defeat, because godly parenting never gives up. Isn't that good and challenging? (laughs) So, you know, if parenting is meant to reflect God to our kids, then let me tell you the one thing I know for sure. The absolute best advice I could ever give anybody is to learn to parent with the Holy Spirit. Learn to partner with the Holy Spirit for your kids. Because the reality is, we cannot do this without the Holy Spirit. John 14, 26, and 27. But the helper, helper, the comforter, the advocate, the intercessor, the counselor, the strengthener, the standby, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, in my place to represent me and act on my, my behalf, he will teach you all things. And he'll help you remember everything that I've told you. Peace I leave with you, my perfect peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be afraid. Let my perfect peace calm you in every circumstance and give you courage and strength for every challenge. I love this. The Holy Spirit is our helper in parenting, and also your comforter, because you're going to need that, and your advocate. You're going to need that. Your intercessor, you're definitely going to need that. Right? Your counselor, all these things. The Holy Spirit helps us in our parenting. And the Holy Spirit will teach us what to do. And the Holy Spirit will give us peace and courage and strength to do the right, to do the right thing. You know, sometimes, because truly I believe that the best the best gift you can give your kids is to learn how to partner with the Holy Spirit. Truly. That means asking the Holy Spirit, what should I do in this circumstance? Because it's going to be natural to just respond how you naturally respond. How you watch other people parent. What, you know, what you see so-and-so doing. What just feels natural and easy. But when we lean into the Holy Spirit from everything for 
Holy Spirit, how do I deal with this insecurity I'm seeing in my kid? Holy Spirit, how do I deal with this constant stomach ache they're having? Holy Spirit, how do I help them, you know, as they're wrestling through questions around their sexuality? Holy Spirit, how do I help them with this, you know, dynamic they're dealing with, or there's learning difficulty, or whatever it is, there's always something. But leaning into the Holy Spirit, and what I have found in my own life, is the Holy Spirit really doesn't care what I think, number one. Sometimes the Holy Spirit says things that offend me, like, do this. I'm like, no. I'm not going to give that child the, you know, I'm not going to just give them mercy right now. Or the Holy Spirit will be like, you know, give me an idea I would have never have thought of. Let me tell you what, the Holy Spirit has also, I think about every time the Holy Spirit's been like, you know what, right now, pause, ask this question. And it's just, oh my gosh, I'm so glad I listened because it was like, just opened up a whole thing that needed to happen. Or grab their phone right now, take a little look. (laughs) Oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. (laughs) The glimpse into hell I just saw. (laughs) Now I know how to pray, (laughs) or whatever. Or the Holy Spirit just, you know, nudging my heart of just saying, hey, pause. Go play, you know, dinosaurs with them right now. That's actually more important than what you're trying to do. Listening to the Holy Spirit, leaning into the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a good helper. You know, I think about all the times how even while when we were pregnant with each of our kids, how much the Holy Spirit would speak to us about each kid, their personality, things that we were to start praying over them, you know, things to be careful and watch out for for them, just being to speak purposes and destiny over them. Here's the reality. God loves your child more than you do. And God knows your child more than you do. So leaning into the Holy Spirit and asking the Holy Spirit how to really love and nurture and care for that child. So what does it really look like to have, you know, spirit-led parenting? You know, I think about Galatians 5.22. Most of us, maybe we've heard this, this verse. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. What does it look like when you're parenting with the Holy Spirit, when you're letting the Holy Spirit work in you? There's all these things, right? There's love, joy, peace, all these things. And the end of that says, against such things there is no law, which in other translations says, never set the law above these qualities, for they're meant to be limitless. Or another translation says, for love is the ultimate goal and expression of the law. I don't know about you, but I need every single one of these things to parent. I need God's love. I need joy. Not like joy that I can muster up on a good day if everything's lined up right and everybody's finally just acting right for five minutes. No, the kind of love and the kind of joy and the kind of peace that is otherworldly, that comes from another source, that is not dependent on if people are acting right or not in my life, that is not dependent on if people are all healthy and everything's okay and, you know, we got out the door on time and, you know, the the bills are paid. The invitation of God is to have love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and all these things that are not We're not victims to our circumstances. And parents, let me tell you, it is a constant battle to not be a victim to your children and whatever they're going through, right? That's for everybody. That's not just for parents. It is a constant choice and a battle to not be a victim to your circumstances. And the moods of people around you and the needs of people around you But the invitation of Christ is to be filled with the Spirit, be connected to a source. There's an endless supply of love, joy, peace, patience, all these things. This is the fruit of the Spirit. This is what, when you walk with the Spirit and you're parenting with the Spirit and you're living with the Spirit, this is the kind of fruit that gets cultivated in your life. And if we're going to parent and love our kids well, man, we need this. Because I don't know about you, but my peace runs out. And my patience certainly runs out. And I'm kind sometimes. And I'm good sometimes, right? I'm gentle sometimes. I have self-control sometimes. But as we lean into God, the invitation is that we can truly have this like 
supernatural source of love and power that we get to walk in and we get to model to our kids. You know, the Holy Spirit as parents, the Holy Spirit gives us wisdom, convicts us when we're out of line so that we as parents can go to our kids and say, you know what, I'm sorry. Maybe you weren't raised in a family where you ever heard your parents say sorry. But you know how powerful that is? When you can go, you can let your, your kids can see you be human and wrestle with all your humanity and yet you model for them what it looks like to go to God? Hey, God's been convicting me and I was out of line and I'm sorry. That's a powerful thing for your kids. As parents, you don't have to have it all together. You don't have to be perfect. You get to be on a journey of learning to walk with the Holy Spirit and letting your kids see that and letting your kids experience the fruit of that. The Holy Spirit will lead you. The Holy Spirit will show you how to pray for your kids, how to help your kids. So, you know, as, I, as I'm wrapping up here, you know, I think one of the biggest things as parents that we need to do is we need to shake off all of, the, all of the lies, the discouragement, the I'm not enough, my house, my kid's bedroom doesn't look like a Pinterest room, my kid's childhood isn't Pinterest perfect. You know, there's so much pressure. And not, nowadays, I don't even have like little kids, but I don't even know. I'm like, I didn't follow these people. Why are they all in my feed? Like, they're everywhere. People telling me how to raise my toddlers. People telling me about the newest model of whatever. Great, but there's, there's just so much information, right? Which is beautiful in one hand. There's a lot of tools out there. Some are better than others. But also, it can leave us feeling like, I'm not good enough. I'm not doing it right. Oh my gosh, Joy's doing it better. Sharon's doing it better. Like We, we start to compare ourselves. And my invitation to you today is to shake all that off. God has given you, for the parents in the room, God has given you the children you have for a reason. He's put inside of you what those kids need. And if you were supposed to parent like Sharon, you would have Sharon's kids. But you have your kids. And they're different. Right? If you were supposed to parent like me, you'd have my kids. But you don't. Your kids are different. So we can't, we can't compare, we, you know, I just feel like there's so many parents feel so stressed out and overwhelmed and like they're not doing it right. No, none of us are doing it right. That's why we need the Holy Spirit. That's the truth. We need the Holy Spirit. We need God to help us. And I think the biggest thing that you can do as a parent, the biggest thing you can do is learn how to be a son or a daughter of God. Learn to receive God's love. Why? So that you can take what you're learning and do that to your kid. When you learn to receive his mercy, you can extend his mercy. When you learn to see, receive his, his patience with you, when you, when you walk with him and you see how kind and patient he is with you, you can extend that to your kid. When you can submit and surrender to his loving and good discipline in your life and you know it's because he loves you and he's helping you and he's strengthening you and he's, he's trying to help you avoid pain in your life. When you can get healthy in that and receive it, you can model that to your kids. So the best way to be a parent is to learn to be a son, to learn to be a daughter. It's the best thing we can do. And then just shake off all the rest, right? I mean, I don't know how any of us survived. I, I really don't. I look back and I think, man, the hand of God, and I had good parents, but like the hand of God of anybody that lived through like the 80s. <laughs> you know, we didn't have seat belts and babysitters and... None of that. I mean, it was Lord of the Flies. It was. We were the latchkey kids. And, you know, we just, I mean, I think back, I started babysitting at nine, like full time, like all summer long, eight hours a day, people left their children with me at nine. What was I going to do if that kid choked? Literally nothing. Sorry, pray for him. I don't know. I had no I was, I, how any of us survived, what is the point of that? God, God is good, God covers the gaps, right? It's not an excuse to be a, a bad parent, but let me tell you what, God will fill the gaps. And that, we need to sleep in peace at night, knowing that we're gonna do our best to demonstrate to our, our kids what you know, God's love looks like. 
But at the end of the day, we have to give our kids back to God. We have to let him fill in the gaps. We have to trust that he's going to pursue them in ways we cannot. We have to trust that he's going to break in, that he's going to help, that he's going to send the right friend or therapist or teacher at the right moment to help in the places we just can't. And let me tell you this, you can't. You can't be all things to your child, right? That's why we need God. That's why we need community. God is bigger and God loves our kids. And so it's this beautiful opportunity for us to not live in fear, for us to not be stuck, you know, and to to be actively shaking off our ego. And I would encourage you, if you are pre-children, you want to have kids, but you don't have kids, to begin this work now of beginning to ask God, like, hey, God, we don't want to just raise kids just like we were raised or do whatever feels natural and easy to us. Help us to truly learn to be sons and daughters so that we can do this with our kids. Help us. That's one of the best things about becoming an adult, right, is is you get to determine the culture of your own family. You get to set that. You get to determine the culture, the environment of your own home. But it's a lot of responsibility. But he meets us in it. And so I want to pray for us. We're going to transition in a moment. I'm going to pray. Let me just say this really quick. Right after service, we have family day. If you're heading to the park, come hang out. Um, Also, if you haven't checked out, you guys, our amazing wall over here um, in honor of, of Hispanic Heritage Month, Go, these are just some people in our, in our church have posted some just beautiful stories and um, brought some items that just have the power of legacy and, and storytelling, so make sure you check that out after service. But will you stand with me as we close? Also, we're going to have prayer available after down in the front if you would like prayer for anything. All right. Jesus, we love you. God, I'm so grateful that you parent us so well. God, I'm so grateful that you understand us and pursue us and are gracious with us. That you do such a good job of just holding our dreams, of being excited about what we're excited about, caring deeply about what we care about never shaming us or humiliating us, always being a safe place for us. God, we are so grateful that you're such a good parent to us. And God, we just lay before you this morning, every, one, every single one of us, because we've all come, are, are products of imperfect parenting. God, we lay before you um, just any wrong beliefs about you that we have picked up because of maybe how we were parented or how you were presented to us, I pray that we would lay down this morning any wrong beliefs about you and that we would have a revelation that you are a good and a loving parent. I pray for freedom in us. I thank you that you have no intention to punish us, but that you always long to restore us. I thank you, God, that you are so faithful and so present, always to pursue us relationally. That you're more concerned with my heart than my behavior. And God, as you have my heart, Lord, I thank you that you have the ability to influence my behavior. And God, I pray that you would help every one of us in this room to truly be able to step in, God, and receive that love and that healing in our life. God, we don't want to pass on dysfunctional things. We don't want to pass on dysfunctional beliefs about you or dysfunctional ways of doing family. God, we confess we all need help. We all need an upgrade. We all need more of you in this area of our life. So God, I pray for every person in this room, for those who are are stand-in parents, for those who are helping support their friends that are parenting, for the aunties and the uncles and and the the step-parents and the adoptive parents, the spiritual parents. Lord, I pray that you would help us all to get an upgrade in this, Lord. 
that we could truly model to people around us what pure, undefiled love looks like. Relentless love, persistent love, love that speaks truth, love that that won't walk away when it gets hard. I pray that you would work that out in us. And God, we stand in agreement today and we pray for every child that's represented in this room. The children of the people of this room, the the nieces and nephews, God, I pray for, for every child that we all have the ability to influence and impact. And God, I pray that you would help us to truly model to them who you are. I pray that you would anoint us to truly be evangelists to those kids as we model love and care and compassion. And Father, for those in the room that are in a, in a place and believing for kids, wanting to have kids, and it just hasn't happened, God, I pray that you would sovereignly open the doors in the right timing, in the right way, God. And that you would make it clear for those that are, if there's contending for fertility, God, that you would make it clear how they can partner with you even in that, Holy Spirit, that you would lead them that you would lead everybody in this room to know um, who's to open their home to adoption, who's to, to step into foster care, who's to, who are children around us that we're supposed to be supporting right now. And for the, the younger couples in the room and people wrestling through, is it the right time to have kids? I pray that you would make it clear, God, that you, Holy Spirit, would lead and make it clear. Father, we pray over every child represented in God. We pray that our kids would know you, Jesus. They would know you. They would be encountered by you, God, that they would never doubt your love, that they would never doubt your goodness, that they would be marked for heaven. They would be marked for your glory, God, that they would know you and experience you. They would be free, free from just religion, free from um, just insecurity, free from all the things the world is trying to throw at them. I pray that they would be free and powerful. God, we bless our kids to thrive and to know you beautifully and wildly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen.